So thank you and thanks for everyone who is attending. So I'm going to try to go through a lot of things with you. Uh, I hope it won't be too much and uh, there will be a pause. The pause is slightly, uh, the timing of the pause is slightly different than what is uh, written in the, on the web's uh, form uh, because in fact the first uh, part after the introduction it's difficult to cut it into two parts so I will uh, finish this very big part of the detailed description of Celosaurus at 4.20 and then we'll have 20 minutes of pause and then continue with all you can use, search in Celosaurus and future development, conclusion and of course your questions. Okay so let's dive in and of course the subject of today are Monday into cell line and everyone which is working in labs in academia and industry are using cell lines. I mean, cell lines are ubiquitous. I mean, there is uh, hundreds of thousands of labs which are using them. And we will see this in more detail. Some of the cell lines are acquired from cell collection. Some are transferred between labs and this can cause issues that we will also discuss. But this we will come back to it. Where do people get their cell line? And of course, there is a number of, of varieties of cell line. I won't go into, into this uh, course in the biology of cell line, but of course, I mean, people have heard of cell line like ELA, which is a cancer cell line, but there is many other types of cell line transformed by virus. There is embryonic stem cells, pluripotent stem cells, hybridomas to produce monoclonal antibodies. So there is a whole menagerie of cell line which are used depending on what people are doing in different labs. So, I mean, people should think widely about cell line, not only think about cancer cell line, which of course are used widely, but it's not the only type of cell line which exists. And in terms of resource around cell lines, there are many cell line catalogs. We'll go back to that. List and ontology and many specialized databases. This we will cover in the next five to 10 minutes, what exists in terms of ecosystem around cell line in terms of database and uh, website. But until Cellosaurus was established, it was no single resource where you could have this information collected and start from this resource and go to a lot of other places to collect all the information you want on a given cell line. Now, why is the Cellosaurus? In fact, there is no single uh, decision taken to build the Celosaurus. In fact, the beginning, before the Celosaurus became named as the Celosaurus, I mean, it was in fact that we needed inside Nextprot, which is a human knowledge platform or human protein knowledge platform, sorry. We wanted to annotate as precisely as possible experiments carried out on human protein or on the autolog of those human protein in other species. So, we wanted, of course, to say which tissues they came from, which species, and of course, as many experiments are done in cell line, which cell line. So at that point, we naively thought that we would use a controlled, existing controlled vocabulary or ontology and just you know, annotate or experiment by saying this is done in cell line X, Y, Z using succession number of that ontology. But in fact, there was no resource which was comprehensive enough and contained all the cell line we needed. At that time, we need, didn't need hundreds of thousands of them. We needed only hundreds of cell lines. I mean, but even such a, this number was quite uh, low. There was no resource which listed those cell lines that we wanted to indicate we were annoting those protein experiments. So, we created what was to be a small cell line thesaurus and therefore the name Celosaurus, a cell line thesaurus. But more and more persons became interested in it and asked if it was possible to add more cell line, but also which is much more important and which, I mean, in fact, uh, uh, allows this course to exist to broaden the scope of what was annotated inside the Celosaurus. And in fact, what is now in the Celosaurus compared to what was before is totally different. And this I can show in a semi-graphical way. You see here, you don't need, it's of course unreadable on your, uh, on your screen, but you see just the size of a cell line entry with uh, something like 15 lines of text in the first release in 2012. 
and the number of line of information for the same cell line entry in release 37, which is three release away. I didn't update this slide because uh, it would just add more line and it would be become anywhere even smaller as a text. So, but you see the principle, not only was the number of cell line increase across time, and we'll see that later, but also what is captured in cellosaurus increased quite dramatically. And we will see what you can find in cellosaurus in the biggest part of this course, in fact. Now, I mean, people, I was speaking before of ontology, we were looking for ontology or database on cell line. And of course, we were specifically looking for an ontology. Now, there was at that time two ontologies specific to cell line, one which still exists, which is called the cell line ontology, which has to, uh, currently about 29,000 terms, which describe 20,000 cell lines. So there is an amount of redundancy because the same cell line can be represented by more than one terms but it has high quality in defining cell type and cell categories. But of course, compared to all the cell lines that exist and which need to be captured in, data, in the database like Cellosaurus, this is not complete enough. And it's an ontology, so it's very useful to classify cell line, but it doesn't contain a lot of information on those cell lines, which is now captured in Cellosaurus. The second ontology, has disappeared. It was developed by an Indian company called Molecular Connection, and it had about 500 cell lines, and they stopped their efforts, I think, in 2013 or 2014. Now, there are some ontology which capture information on cell line. The most, I mean, known one is uh, the BTO, Brand Tissue Ontology, which has information on about almost 2,400 cell line, and it is a cell line which are used in experiments that are annotated in Brenda on enzyme. So Brenda is a database on enzyme and it's annotated many paper on those enzyme. And of course, when a cell line is used in those paper, they basically, I mean, create an entry inside Brenda. It used to have a lot of duplicate runners, but now we have a huge, I mean, a very good collaboration. And so it's basically a feedback where the sand so what entries are creating and we send back if there is errors or things to be corrected in BTO. And then EBI has an experimental factor ontology, which covers cell line used in context of some EBI database or encode. And it's not very big, 1,300 cell line. And then I won't really mention, but uh, just put some here, two other ontology which contain information in cell line, BCGO and MESH, which is a huge, uh, ontology of medical subjects, but in terms of cell line, it only has 25 cell lines. Okay, so that's about ontologies and uh, cell line. But the question is, we have to first go and start with the beginning. Who is distributing cell line? Because then this will give us an information of where you can find information on the cell line. Well, one of the places where people acquire cell line are what are called cell collections. So those are institutions that distribute from a few hundreds up to about 40,000 for the Coriel Institute, different cell line. And most of those cell collection are not only distributing cell line, but they also distribute microorganisms, bacteria, fungi, and some even distribute vectors or plasmid and so on. So they're generally big entities and they distribute I mean, uh, so it's biological uh, samples all over the world. Some, most of them are non-specialized, meaning they distribute all kinds of cell lines from a lot of different organisms, but some specialize either in one category of cell line, like you have uh, two uh, listed here, EBISC and Y cell, which only distribute stem cells, and some are specialized in an organism like DGRC distribute Drosophila cell line, TCB distribute tick cell line, and so on. And most of them are global. Some are specific to a country, but this is quite rare. Most of them now ship cell line globally. So here, I'm not going to go through the list, but you see about 40 names from a lot of different countries, USA, Germany, Italy, Japan, uh, all over the world of entities which distribute cell line. The most well-known one is ATCC. 
so American type uh, collection, I mean, cell collection, sorry, which is really, I mean, a huge entity which distributes, as I said before, not only cell line, but uh, organisms, microorganisms. So a lot of people have heard of ATCC, but they're not the only one. Now, this is for those cell collection, which are generally not always, but they're a non profit organization, which became very big, but they're basically set up as non-profit entities which distribute cell lines all over the world. And SANS are companies which have been established, which either establish themselves cell line or distribute cell line, I mean, uh, from which were established by different laboratories. And here you have a list of company, I mean, uh, ABM, Adex Bio, I mean, uh, you can recognize the very well-known company like Perkinelmer, Millipore, Fuji and so on. There is a huge number also of other uh, companies which I didn't list here, which only distribute a few cell lines. Some are even created around one cell line. So this is a startup where, I mean, a scientist has created a cell line, which I feel is very important and they try to sell it through a company. There is a problem with those companies, not those companies which are listed above, but there are a number of rogue, what I call rogue companies or pirate companies, which are distributing cell lines that they have acquired illegally. And this is quite a problem because of course, people could say, well, it's okay. I mean, I'm getting my cell line much cheaper than from other company or from cell collection. Yes, but they don't do any QC. And what you get is maybe not what you think you're getting. And so it's basically company are giving a bad names to other cell collection because people think, oh, well, I got probably this was an ATCC cell line, but in fact, they didn't get it from ATCC, but by, by one of those company. And what they get is probably not really what they wanted. I mean, those companies are unfortunately located in one or two countries, which are quite difficult for legal entities to I mean, prosecute, I'm not giving to, to list names, but yeah, I guess most of you are intelligent enough to guess where those company could be located. But it's not obvious to know those company out there because they generally take American sounding names and have websites which are registered in US or in Europe. So be careful in terms of those companies. I mean, if you suddenly see a company which sells thousands of cell lines and it's not one of the big well-known uh, company or cell line collection, be careful. Chance are this is one of those pirate companies. Now, the biggest, I would say, way of distributing cell line is among academic labs. We all do this. I mean, uh, ourselves, we have a lab in Geneva. And yes, what we did is when we wanted to have some cell line, we first asked our colleague, do you happen to have ELA? Do you happen to have MC F7? Oh, can you give us an alicot? And people do that, which is normal. I mean, say, I mean, uh, share the cells between labs. And some, in fact, which have established a line, distribute them through their transfer office or biomedical resource facility. But most often, this is done in an ad hoc way. And a lot of people are just distributing cell line, which, in fact, they got from cell collection or from colleagues without really checking if they could do so or if that's the right to do so. Most often they don't. Most often people close an eye on this practice. So you have people distributing cell line, which get distributed again and again and again. You've got like these chains of cell line, which have gone from, I mean, all over the world from one lab to another one. But it can be a recipe for disaster, as we'll see later in terms of what people are using may not be what they think they're using. Now, let's go now in terms of what there is in terms of so cell line collection and what you can find and so on in terms of information. So there is those 50 major entities which are listed in uh, two slide or three slide away. So the problem with those cell collection is not one in terms of all the distributed cell lines. They're very good at distributing them, at shipping them, you get what you want, but they're not really, I mean, well, I mean, uh, I would say versed into good practice in bioinformatics. And that means that a catalog or I mean, say a website can change from one day to another one. You don't have any 
follow up of a cell line can disappear because it's decided not to distribute it, but you won't find it anymore and you don't know why. And so basically something like five years ago, I started drafting five minimal requirements for I mean, cell collections that say should have one web page for each cell line instead sometime of grouping you know, 10 cell line in one web page. And it would be good that their, the URL they use for their page is based on their catalog number instead of a description which can change over time. And they should make people aware that they have new cell line or cell line that they don't distribute. And one thing very important for human cell line, which I'm not going to explain just now because we'll go deep into that, they should make what we call STR profile available. For a moment, let's keep this as uh, just uh, terminology, but we go back to that. Current situation, if you look at this color code, I mean, from an Excel spreadsheet, in green, so it's been compliant, orange is more or less compliant, and red is not compliant. And you can see that was the first uh, requirement, having individual page for each cell line is quite okay, except for some uh, uh, cell collection. As you go into so the four others requirement, it is really a problem. And so four to one, which is to tell people that they have discontinued cell line, none of them are really doing it well. So, I mean, generally, I mean, uh, hide it very well since so I've stopped distributing a cell line. Now, getting information, you can get information on cell line from cell line collection, but there is also some cell line database. In fact, in addition to Cellosaurus as a universal resource, there is a database which is established in uh, Italy in Genova called the Cell Line Database, CLDB. It's really a high quality database. Really, when I started Cellosaurus, I thought first that I didn't need to do anything because CLDB was really capturing data on cell line quite nicely. So it's two problems. I mean, it's, it's a, one problem is that they're not updating it since 2017. But even before, they were not adding any cell line for a long, long time. And they only have 6,000, as you see, almost 7,000 entries describing uh, a little bit more than 4, 5,400 different cell lines. So that's tiny compared to the world of cell line. And I've discussed with the people which developed it. It's a classical uh, problem. They had a grant in the early, late, late 2000 to the early 2010. A European grant, the grant was over. So, you know, basically they couldn't really continue to uh, develop the database. But there is a number of specialized resources. One which is really quite good, which is a human pluripotent stem cell registry, which caters for human uh, ESC and IPSC. It's very high quality. And it's based, it's a registry, so it's based on voluntary registration of people creating new cell line to go on this site and creating entries, which is quite nice. And they have already quite a number of cell lines which have been registered. The problem is a lot of people create cell line and don't bother registering them. So that's one issue problem. Happily, some journals are now forcing people which are creating those type of cell line to register them. So there is a portal also on stem cell in Japan called SKIP. There is a database of cell lines which are used for leukocyte antigen, so HLA typing. So that's a very specialized uh, cell line collection. And unfortunately, there is a lot of dead resource. There used to be a cell line data, uh, database on prostate cancer, one on fish, one on insect, and all of those are either completely dead, you don't see them on the web, or they're still there, but they have not been updated since they were first put on the web. So not a lot of resource specific on database, on, sorry, on cell line. But you do find a lot of information on cell line in all of the experimental portals or repository. And specifically, you have a lot of information which you can find on cell line in cancer for cancer cell line. And one of the big projects is the Cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia, which is now called the Cancer Dependency Map from the Broad Institute. And in CCLA Dip Map, you find a huge number of something now, 1,500, I think, cancer cell line, which have been exome sequence, which is a fusions, 
Aminibse was uh, gene fusion have been annotated. I mean, transcription has been annotated, RNA-seq. A lot of experiments have been carried out, omics experiments on those cell lines. And all of the information is, of course, freely available and downloadable from those, uh, the resource depth map. There is a resource on drug sensitivity in cancer. One, another resource on cancer cell line that's uh, in Texas at MD Anderson. The Sanger Institute as a cancer saline project, which is a little bit the same type of uh, work being carried out in the road on the, in the depth map project, but it has some cell lines which are not in depth map and vice versa. And for IPSC, there is two initiatives, sorry, one initiative, sorry, I got my screen which went one slide too far. So human IPSC initiative, which develops and capture a lot of information on some IPSC. So in addition to those specific experimental portals which caters for cell line, you have a number of integrative portals which have been created, which integrate omics data from other type of collections. So you have cell minor, cell model passport, also at the Sanger Institute, the colorectal cancer atlas, and an integrated resource of human cell line for identification. As you see, they have a number of a varying number of cell lines. The first one I didn't put because it's NCI 60, it's 60 cell line. It's a set of 60 cell line. The biggest one is cell model passport with almost 2000. So it's basically resource and PharmacoDB, which mine pharmacogenetic data sets. So what those things are, those resources are doing, they mine repositories, experimental repositories, like Array Express, Geo, uh, and other, I mean, repository for information on cell line. Most of them, again, are on cancer cell lines. Now, you find also a lot of information on cell line in all of those resources which are not cell line specific, like Array Express and Geo. The European Genome Phenome Archive, Biosample, Campbell, Cosmic, the Encyclopedia of Genetic Elements, the FCS3 database, uh, YARC TP53. I just go through it. I'm not going to describe them. You, have to, you can get those slides, of course, after the talk. So you can go back and look at those databases and you can Google them and find them. And a lot of them you probably know, like Metabolite for Metabolomics, Pride for Proteomics, and so on. So there you have information on cell line, but they're not, most of them are not specific to cell line, with the exception of a few of them, like the last one, Tokyo E, which is on transfection information for cell line. So I guess you can understand that what there is, it's a very fragmented and heterogeneous landscape of resource around cell line, which leads to the cellosaurus. And I will first go on one slide on cellosaurus and then go in more details in what there is in it. So you would guess it's a knowledge resource on cell line because otherwise, why would I speak about that for the last 20 minutes? And it has now, I mean, almost 140,000 entries. Its scope is all the different type of cell line I mentioned before, immortalized, naturally immortal, but it, cell line, it does not cover primary cells because those are not cell line and not plant cell line, which are really a very specific set of cell line, which are not in fact inside the scope of cellosaurus. So you could see this as what is called animal cell line from insect to vertebrate, but not, I mean, from plants. About 50 different type of information items. We'll see this later and a lot of literature reference and cross-reference. It's accessible and we'll see this also on the web and you can download it in three different formats. And part of the content is loaded in the Wikidata. This also I will describe to you in a few, I mean, after the pause, when we go and do search, I mean, explain how to search in Cellosaurus. It's part of the resource identification initiative. I will explain to you what it is because that's quite important. And it's also participant of the International Cell Line Authentication Committee, again, I will come back to that. I already told you about the human pluripotent stem cell registry. And so it's a lot of collaboration with many other resources and collections. It is what is called an elixir core data resource. So elixir, 
I mean, which is a European portal for, I mean, uh, uh, bioinformatic resource is basically selecting every year a number of resources that it terms core data resource, which are important, I mean, uh, worldwide in terms of uh, bioinformatic resource. And last year, so Celosaurus was selected as a core data resource. It's also a near DIC recognized resource. Since maybe you know less, it's, uh, I mean, uh, a group of people working on rare disease. It's an international rare disease organization and say, give a stamp of uh, approval to database which cater, I mean, to, for, uh, on information which is useful for people working on rare disease. And of course, a lot of cell line in Celosaurus are derived from patients a fibroblast or other tissue of patients suffering from rare disease, whether it's rare genetic disease or rare cancer. Okay, so if I want to go again in one slide in terms of history of cell line, I already told you that cellular started as a control vocabulary for cell line of Nexprot. And then what the so first time it was called Celosaurus and became available first on the Nexprot FTP site was in February 2012, so exactly 10 years ago. I mean, in fact, I didn't realize, uh, I suddenly realized that I missed, I mean, for a few days, by a few days, I think it's a birthday, because I think it was on 10th of February, 10th birthday. And it had at this time cross reference to 21 resource and 1,000 literature reference and eight information fields. And then it grew, but what was important in 2015, it became available on the XPASI server, where you probably have used it because that's the main place where you can get access to XPASI. There are other source where you can get it, but the main one is on XPASI. And then in 2016, it became the cell line resource for this resource identification initiative, which I will explain. In Still in 2016, it's continued to grow and there was this STR profile, again, something I'm going to explain, which were introduced and uh, became a member of the ICLAC committee, which again, I will explain. And then in 2016, still a distribution XML, which is quite important for people wanting to pass and extract information from Celosaurus. A paper on Celosaurus was published in 2018 and a tool called CLASP, which I will describe also was uh, developed by Thibaut Robin in 2019. He became in 2021, uh, Elixir Core Data Resource and a NIRDIC recognized resource. I should add also that at the end of 2021, it became funded by the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics, which allocate now, I mean, it's equivalent of one developer position, which will allow us to develop quite a number of things in terms of software development around the Celosaurus. Now, how to get information in Celosaurus, even if I didn't describe yet what you find in it, well, I can tell you already, it's a different pipeline which allow to get information in Celosaurus. In fact, there is four of them. It's basically extracting data from cell line collection, which have product page. I already told you they're not really well organized in terms of bioinformatics, so their page are generally free text. Some of them are structured, so it's possible to write script to extract information. Most of the time, I mean, when I contact them, they send me Excel spreadsheet. And yes, it's possible then to get information and it's to extract, but it's a hassle, but it's possible to extract information from them. Extracting data from external bioinformatic resource that cater for specific data relevant to cell line, like sequence variation or HLA typing and others. So that's generally easier once you have defined what you want, because then those resources are generally much better organized than cell line collection, and you can already download files that exist. If you take Cosmic, it's possible to load the Cosmic sequence variation file or the depth map, also somatic mutation page and so on, and you can extract whatever information you need. But in fact, also one of the main point of entry is manual curation from publications. So it's about 23,000 now uh, publications which are cited in Celosaurus. Every publication in the Celosaurus which is cited has been in fact curated. It doesn't mean the publication has been read completely because if there is only one small section on cell line in a publication discussing other things, the rest of the publication was not read, but everything which was on the cell line, yes. 
and all of them are saved in PDF so that we can go back and uh, get the information. So apart from three or four publications, uh, all of the, those 23,000 publications have the PDF stored I mean, uh, locally. And one thing which is uh, quite, I mean, uh, nice is we get more and more submission, I mean, from people of information on cell line. And uh, I saw, I mean, as we were waiting for the course to start that we have somebody, uh, Petar from uh, Croatia, and I was just, uh, Petar was Zretic, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. And I saw that you have an abstract on generation of knockouts melanoma cell lines. So, I mean, it would be nice to get the information, even if it's pre-publication on those knockout melanoma cell lines. And uh, we get more and more submissions, so that's nice. But if there are people here which have information, please do not, I mean, uh, hesitate to submit information. Now, in fact, in terms of how to get the information still on uh, manual curation, so, where to find the papers that's not so complex. I mean, it's either papers cited in cell line distribution documentation, PubMed and Google search, Google Scholar alerts. Uh, for people which are bioinformatic, uh, bioinformatician, you may know that PubMed has something called you know, LitSuggest, which is a nice AI-driven system where you can basically uh, give examples of the, the articles you're interested in, and it gives, it basically do, uh, does machine learning approach and every week give you uh, a list of publication which uh, I mean uh, seems relevant to what you gave it as criteria so it works well. Then of course we retrieve the full text and as I said before we retrieve more than 99% of the paper that were cited, store them locally and so on. And of course reading the part of the information. A lot of case it's also contacting authors to clarify points which are not clear in publication or to ask additional information. This is quite difficult to get response. After pestering people up to three or four times, I stop. But after three email, I generally do not get over 50% response rate. Okay, let's dive in inside what you have in Celosaurus. And we'll start with name and identifier. I mean, by every database needs to have names and identifiers. And this leads to a problem about cell line names. So we'll see this and names and synonym misspellings, we'll see accession numbers. And here I will explain what I already mentioned twice, which is a resource identification initiatives and something called error IDs. So names. So big problem is that short cell line names are a disaster which doesn't stop people from using short cell line names. And here you have 10 names, which are used by 37 different cell lines. And this is in fact, I mean, uh, only the tip of the iceberg. And you have, I mean, now more than a thousand sets of cell lines we share either as a, as a name or a synonyms with another cell line. And it's basically really problematic because if you just see it in a paper without knowing the context, with, and even sometimes if you know the context, it can be difficult to know which cell line is being described. The problem is when people propose longer name, sometimes, I mean, what researchers will do is abbreviate them. So you have, for example, a, name, a cell line called FG2C3A, which is okay. And then, of course, everyone starts calling it C3A, which is not okay because it's too short, it confused with other cell line, it confused with the gene name and so on. You could say, well, maybe what would be nice is to have nomenclature rules. So there have been two which have been proposed, one for insect cell line in 1970s and which is not really followed. And one which is starting to be followed for pluripotent and stem cell line in 2018. But mostly people do what they want and it's a disaster. And of course, in addition, to the short uh, names, so there is a lot of misspellings in the literature. Now, this leads to, I mean, uh, what we capture inside Celosaurus, we capture as the name of the cell lines, the one, I mean, which is the one assigned, I mean, by its creator, 
or if it, I mean, basically, uh, generally it's one which was first published, except in some rare case where that name was never used anymore and another name was used. And uh, basically, I mean, uh, 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 oh yes, also if it's problematic, if it's really too short, we try to use a synonym which is a bit longer as a, I mean, it's a recommended name for that cell line. So casing is important. So you can have two cell lines which have the same, I mean, name like Bob and Bob, but they're co considered as different name because the casing is different. So because of the, what I was telling you is that some cell lines share the same name with others, what we're obliged to do in Cellosaurus is postfix identical name with a small textual description. So here you see two cell lines which are called AML14. One is a human leukemia cell line and the other one is a mouse liver cell line. So they both go, to, I mean, are called AML14. They don't have any uh, synonyms which allows them to be distinguished. So what we have to do is to postfix a name with a small description, which allows people to immediately see that this is AML14 in the context of human leukemia and so the one is a mouse liver. So we try also to capture as many synonyms as possible. And here also casing and punctuation is important. We capture abbreviation, but also expansion of the name. So here you have ELA MCF7 and MCF7, an expansion of MCF7 is explanation why it's called MCF7, Michigan Cancer Foundation 7, or ELA being Arietta Lax cells or SUDHL4, Stanford University diffuse histostatic lymphoma 4. And here you see many different variation on the term of SUD DHL4, even going to SU4 or DHL4 and so on. So all these are captured as synonyms and misspellings are captured also. So we record misspellings and we record it if it's specific to a publication or a database entry. Like here's this misspelling is in this publication, this misspelling is in COSMIC, and here's accession number of the COSMIC entry. And in some case, we did mistake in Cellosaurus. So we indicate that we misspelled, I mean, the cell line, and uh, from which release to which release it was, it was misspelled. So continuing on cell line and, uh, and the names and identifier, every, entry as a unique stable identifier, the so accession string, which in a format CVCL and then a letter, another, I mean, sorry, another uh, uh, letter, I mean, sorry, a letter or a number and it's followed by a letter or a number and so on. And you have like this, I mean, uh, a four, I mean, alphanumerical characters, which follows the CVCL. Some people ask why CVCL, it used to be because this was a, CV for cell lines, the control vocabulary for cell line. Of course, it's much more than that, but it was logical to have CVCL. Sometimes you need to merge two or more entries when you see it's the same cell line. It happens that you, know, you like looking at publication, you don't see that two cell lines are identical because they're using different names. And then you find suddenly someone telling you, or you find a publication which says, oh, by the way, the cell lines that we named such and such, was in fact named something else in different publications. So in this case, you have secondary accession numbers. And it happens quite rarely that an entry can be deleted if it's not a cell line and it was basically uh, didn't exist. So that's quite rare. Now, I was promising you to explain to you what is a resource identification initiative. So, it was introduced something like, I would say, eight or nine years ago, uh, this concept of having research resource identifiers. So for each resource which is used experimentally, like antibodies, cell line, organism, or even ex things like software tools, to have for each of them a unique stable identifier, which is called a RRID. And basically, the idea was that if people started citing this in their paper, then people could basically reproduce much more easily experiments. So 
there is, I mean, this I, I don't know if you like this for antibodies, for organism, for strain, and for cell line, it is the cellosaurus which has been selected by the research resource, uh, I don't know if you're, I mean, uh, initiative as a resource for RAID. So basically what happens in papers, what you see is when people are citing those RIDs, they prefix it by RID, and then they give the accession number of the database, which is used to as a resource identification identifier. So for example, when it's uh, an antibody, it's using the antibody registry. So it's prefixed by AB and so it's CVCL, the so cellulosaurus accession number for cell line. And you can search and display all those error ID at a portal, which is on a site called SciCrunch. So here is an extract of an abstract, not an abstract, sorry, of a method part of a paper in eLife, the journal eLife, which correctly indicate which cell lines they have used. So this says the raw 264 mouse macrophage cell line. So it gives their ID obtained from ATCC and so on. And so explain basically what cell line they have used and give the catalog number or not, but at least the place where they got it, like uh, ATCC and so on, or someone like uh, this one was provided by John Masage from Memorial Sloan Kettering. But you have like this, all of the access, uh, accession number of the cellulosaurus. And of course, if you were looking at monoclonal antibody, you would have the RID for monoclonal antibodies and so on. Now, so that's quite useful. And it's, it's useful if people are using it, of course. If, people are, if there is RID and people are not using it, it's basically failing. And I think I'm optimistic that it's working because you see here, I mean, we started, being recognized as a resource for RID for saline at late 2016. And the so number of paper which cites RIDs for saline, meaning cellulosaurus succession numbers, is increasing every year. And it's now almost 2000, it was 1,900 something in uh, 2021. I guess in 2022, it will be more than uh, 2,000 papers. It's tiny compared to the number of papers which are using saline, but the trend is going in the right direction which is, I mean, nice to see. Now, it's important to say where cell line comes from. And for this, I mean, what we mean by this is which species it comes from. If it's a non-human cell line, which breed and subspecies. If it's a human cell line, which population. And for human cell line, we also sometimes have information on the genomic ancestry. I will explain all this. HLA typing, the sex of the donor, and the age of sampling, and anatomical origin. Okay, let's go into all of those. Species of origin, it's easy. We indicate it using the NCBI tax ID. So if you have a human sign line, you have a tax ID of Homo sapiens. Now, you have some cell lines, which are hybrids. One big category are hybridomas which can have more than one species of origin because they're hybrid of more than one cell. And of course, those cells can come from more than one species. So we have about 900 uh, entries which come from two species and even just little over less than 10 entry nine, which have three species. And in this case, you have as many OX line as you have species. In a few cases, we don't know where the cell line comes from. So I mean, we use the tax ID for unidentified, which is defined at NCBI when people don't know what species uh, they're using. So species, not really any issues. Breed and subspecies, this is difficult to standardize. So it's free term information. It's sometimes difficult to know which breed of animal or I mean, insect or substrain or subspecies have been used. It's not always uh, indicated. So currently we have about 820 different values for about almost 20,000 animal cell line. So here I give you five examples of what I mean. One for mouse, C57, uh, black six, for a dog, for a bovine crossover of Hereford with limousin, uh, zebrafish, which is glowing in, in uh, 
uh, UV light, glowfish, and uh, the famous Drosophila uh, strain Oregon R. So this, there is no database for, I mean, really uh, capturing this. So this, as I said, is free text. Now, population information, it's a mine field because people sometimes speak of population, some in data, some cell line or some database speak of ethnicity. Of course, nobody used the word race, but if you go to old papers, this was listed. You had list of cell lines saying, which race it was from, I mean, white, black, and so on. And, uh, and of course, I thought basically in cellulosaurus, we should not really know down where a cell line comes from, from which population. But in fact, uh, it seems that the fact that there is this bias, that a lot of research or medical research is done on what people know are called Caucasian European population, then it means that there is not enough data on other population. Thus, it's useful to note down which cell lines come from different type of populations so that people have access to, I mean, models which are not the standard uh, WASP, uh, white uh, Anglo-American type of uh, population. So this is now captured in, uh, in, uh, in Cellosaurus with a number of terms which are used in, by a lot of different database like Caucasian and so on, but it's, it's quite difficult because I mean, those definitions are really vague. And uh, of course, when people are mixture, hefty mixture of a lot of different population, it becomes a nightmare, but still you have information like this, African, Somali, Caucasian, Swiss, and so on, which are put in data in cell line if it's recorded, but we don't hunt specifically for this information. If people have provided it, we put it, but otherwise, we're not going to ask for, for this information. So now about 35% of human cell line entries have this information. I don't think it's going to grow a lot more because a lot of cases, this is not indicated and that's fine. But I mean, you have, I mean, uh, already 35% with this population information. So there is a group in US, I mean, in uh, Puerto Rico and in California, which has developed, uh, which is led by Julie Dutille, which has, done analysis of cancer cell line to look at what is the ancestry of the cell line in terms of seven populations. So they took 1,400 cell line with the exome. And also one, and they looked at the 1,000 genome project where the donor population is known because by definition, those were done on people from, uh, I mean, uh, where the population, uh, where they came from was known. And from this, they consider seven ancestral population and since they make a admixture computation and give you this type of information, like for ELA cell line, it's African at 64.74%, 0.77% Native American and so on. And you have basically like this uh, genome ancestry of this cell line based on the 1000 human genome project. Now, we capture also if it's available information on HLA typing. I'm not going to go in a lot of details because this is very specific and people which work on it knows that we have this information. And this is shown here, or HLA typing with HLA type one or type uh, DB2 and so on with uh, allele. Quite complex for people which don't know what it is, but so people which work on HLA typing know exactly what I, I mean by this. Now, one thing which is, of course, very important is to define which sex a cell line comes from. So we have a control vocabulary with only five terms, female, male, mixed sex, when there is more than one animal which was used to create a cell line, or sex ambiguous in terms of people having, I mean, uh, disease of, I mean, uh, like y, extra X chromosome, extra Y chromosome, and all of the uh, different type of sexual identity at the level of chromosomal de 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 defect. And of course, for a lot of cell line, we don't know, so we put sex unspecified. So already described mixed sex, what it's used, sex ambiguous, sex, uh, ambiguous. In some case, we may know later 
where the sex comes from, which the cell line comes from, but for some of them, we will never know. And of course, hybrid cell line and hybridoma are not annotated with this information because it would be quite complex as it's from two different cell lines. So to define what is the sex of a cell line, which is an hybrid, is a little bit problematic in terms of definition. Age of sampling is quite useful to know if uh, at which age the cell line was derived. So it can be a precise value in day or even week, month, year, or range. We, it can be someone between 50 or 55 years. And it can be a developmental stage in some cases, especially for some animals like insects. It will be saying fifth instar larval stage or a lamb for sheep and so on. So it's basically, for a moment, it's text. And if it's not known, it's agent specified. Again, hybrid cell and hybrid are not annotated. About 90% of the entry contained information on sage at sampling. And uh, just for your uh, as an anecdote, the oldest donor, which is uh, registered in such cell service for human cell line, was 114 year old when the cell line was created. It's a series of cell line from Sardinian centenarian. And the oldest one was 114 year old. Now, last thing about where cell line come from, it's anatomical information, which organ and tissue. So there is two common fields called derived from sampling site and derived from metastatic site. And currently it used to be like this, with just text and uh, like uh, caudal fin, bone, mandible, and lymph node, with information on the organ and tissue, but not the cell type and no, uh, ontology links to it. Now, the thing is first to retrofit this information in all of the entry where we can, and it's about now 80% uh, done. So 70 to 80% will be done at the next release. And since the next step, which I will describe later, is to, cut, to, sorry, to, uh, to link this textual information to the uberon anatomical ontology and also to the cell line, not the cell line ontology, the cell ontology, not CLO, but CL, which describes the cell type. So to give the example of this bone uh, jaw mandible term, it will be linked to uberon term, which is a uberon term for mandible. And if this cell comes from an osteoblast, for example, it will also be linked to the term, the cell line ontology, sorry, cell type ontology, CL, to the cell type for I mean, osteoblast. Okay, so this is a work in progress. Now, something very important is cell line integrity. And this is the issue of cell line contamination or misidentification. And I will speak about ICLAC, annotation of problematic cell line, and tell you what it is, STR profile and what you can do with seven cell cells. Now, cell line contamination is a huge problem. Many studies have used the wrong cells. And these are titles of articles. It's not me which is saying with this, it's all you know, titles of articles, which are saying things like cost of using an anticipated cell line, is, is it's costly, it's a dirty little secret of cancer research and so on. People estimate that about 30% of cancer cell line which are used in literature are contaminated, which means that people are using one cell line, but it's not the cell line which they think they're using. Now, sometimes it's not a big deal and sometimes it can be catastrophic. What I mean by this is, let's say you're using a cell line just to express a protein. It doesn't matter if the cell line comes from breast or prostate, as long as you manage to overexpress or express your protein. If you're using as a factory to do something, it doesn't matter. If you're using a cell line because you're studying prostate cancer and you're using a breast cancer cell line, then you're in deep trouble. So it can go from not really important to having your papers having to be, I mean, uh, uh, invalidated completely. So a few definitions in terms of what we mean by contaminated. 
you can have contaminated cell line because you have either foreign cell line, which have, I mean, uh, basically overrun your culture. You had a breast cancer cell line and suddenly a prostate cancer cell line, which you had somewhere else in the lab, I mean, started growing in your uh, Petri dish and you basically, I mean, lost your breast cancer cell line because it was overrun by this more, I mean, aggressive uh, growth of this other cell line. Or you can have, I mean, uh, contamination to microorganisms, whether it's mycoplasma and fungi. This I'm not going to describe because this is another problem. It doesn't change which cell line you're using, what you think you're using. It just makes your life a bit difficult because you need to clean up your cell line. You have to basically suppress this contamination, which can overrun your cell culture. So it's a mess for people growing cell line, but it's not a problem in terms of papers and results. No, misidentified cell line, it's when you think you have a cell line from one species or gender, but it's not the right one. You think you got your cell line from a dog, but it's not from a dog, uh, it was from a cat or something like that. And in some case, you have what we call misclassified. It's a tissue which is wrong or the cell type or even the disease. You thought you had a, you know, a cell from one tissue and it's from another one. Now here you have a joke which was inside one of the TIPS article 10 years ago, where in fact, yes, when people suddenly end the C sets have a Y chromosome, it's an ELA cell, which is a female cell line, they're in deep trouble. Now, this is something which happens quite a lot. And you have papers reporting when it's found out, what happens is people generally write articles about it. And here you see three different examples. Uh, bladder cancer cell line, which is not a bladder cancer cell line, but which is ELA. Somebody which thought they had uh, cell line from one monkey, which is Cercopithecus etiops, but it's not from that monkey. And someone which thought they had a cancer cell line from a seminomona, but it's not a seminomona, it was another cancer. Three different type of problems, all of them which can be really, uh, really bad. So a few years ago, I mean, well, 10 years ago, in fact, at the same time almost that uh, uh, service started, the International Cell Line Notification Committee was founded. And it was founded by people working on cell line collection and which were involved in trying to clean up this problem to really promote, I mean, uh, the work of finding those errors, erroneous cell line, makes them more visible and combat, you know, basically fight against this problem of, uh, problematic cell line. So they create a register of misidentified cell line and each candidate on this register is carefully appraised by the committee, which sometimes has to go back and ask people to go back in fridge on 20 year old sample, or even sometimes 30 year old to do and re, I mean, sometimes uh, uh, analyze some frozen samples to see what happened to try basically it's a detective work. And one of the person doing this, Amanda Capes Davis, or moniker in on uh, Twitter is cell detective. So if you look up for cell detective, you will find Amanda Capes Davis, which is one of the person involved in ACLAC since the beginning. Now, a lot of the new candidates are identified through the process of creating cell line information. Cell also doesn't change the process. Once those candidate goes to ACLAC, they need to be studied. And so you have a website, ACLAC, which has those register and which link back also of course to Cellosaurus. And inside the Cellosaurus, you have information of those problematic cell line with a common field called problematic cell line. And here are examples, contaminated, shown to be ELA derivative, misidentified, orgy thought of being of human origin, being, but found to be from pig, misclassified, orgy thought to originate from neuroblastoma, but is from an living sarcoma, and so on. So you have this information and also in cell line which are derived from a problematic cell line. So sometimes some people take a problematic cell line, they don't know it's problematic and they derive a new cell line. But basically if it's already contaminated, it continues to be contaminated and thus contamination uh, goes from parent to child on the cell line and you need to indicate like here, contaminated, the grandparent cell line KB has been shown to be ELA derivative. So 
I mean, all of the problematic cell lines are linked to the registration command if there is one in ICLAC with the number of the register, ICLAC register. So there is a little bit above 1,000 cell lines which are noted as problematic, and you can grow them through the main menu of cellulosis and expansion. So it's growth problematic. And when you go to one of those cell lines, it's in fact in red, you have a big, I mean, red text, which tells you that it is problematic. So you cannot miss that it's a problematic cell line. Now, what can we do to stop this from happening? Now, what people have recognized for already almost 20 years ago is that you can have, you have loci in human genome, which are highly polymorphic which are small repeats of DNA, which can be sequenced quite easily and which are basically quite variable across population or even in between individuals of the same family. Of course, if they're from fam same families, there will be similarity, but it will basically drift and you can have a change from one person to another one. And those are used in forensic identification and paternity testing. And in fact, they can use, be used to ensure the quality and integrity of human cell line. So in 2011, a first standard was published, which said that they could use eight different loci, eight of the sites on the human genome plus one. I will explain what, after why the plus one. And now in two, last year, there was a revision of this NC standard with 13 loci plus one. You can buy kits to test your cell line. Generally, those kits have 18 loci because that's what's used by FBI and by paternity testing. So people are all using the same type of test kit to do it. And you have those loci, which have very barbaric name, which are positions, I mean, inside the human genome on chromosome 13. Sometimes it's a gene name, a near gene name. You can recognize CSF1 and TPOC, TPO, uh, and so on, w, uh, von Willebrand factor. And one of them is special because it's supposed to be showing you if a cell line is from female or male, if it's amelogenin from female only or from male and female and a Y chromosome, so it's two allele. Unfortunately, it doesn't work well because uh, Y chromosome can be lost in a lot of cell lines. So, and people have not developed SCR marker for mouse and dog cell line. So what people can do, they can do it themselves or send to company. They give a little bit of DNA from the cell line or the cell line itself. The company extracts the DNA, run, I mean, a kit, a sequencing kit on those primers for those different uh, loci and give you the results of which allele is found, the number of copy of each allele, 15 copy of the D8, FFR1 and 16 and so on. You can have multiple, of course, you can have one or two because you people have two chromosomes, but if it's a cancer cell line, you can have even more because you can have a lot of uh, uh, chromosomal duplication, but generally that's what you get with a normal cell line. Uh, peaks, either one peak or two peaks, depending if the person is heterozygous in one of those loci or not. And once you have them, you can use them to compare with other cell lines. Problem is a lot of company keeps a database of STR profile private. So what happened is that in cellulosaurus, we capture if it's available in publication in cell line collection, those information. We now have almost 8,000 of cell line which have this information. And most of them are for human because the mouse and dog STR profile is only starting, but this will increase, especially for mouse. And we indicate where we got this information from. It can be one site or it can be a lot of different sites. Here we got information on the STR profile of this cell line with from sorry, seven or eight different places, publication and cell lines, database. And we annotate conflict between different sources. What I mean is here, here you have a cell line with five different sources, five different, four different cell collection and cosmic cell line project, which have done the STR profile of this cell line and they agree on seven of the different uh, loci but for melogenin, one says it's X, Y, and the other only X. Again, as I told you, it's because cell lines often lose a Y chromosome. And here, RCB, the Japanese database, thinks that there is three peaks in this position, while the three others think there is two peaks. It can be an error, or it can be just slight variation on cell line, 
when it has been grown, for example, here in Japan, it's a Salon collection, while other Salon collection have maybe grown it less, and this one has acquired a new mutation, or sometimes it can be a little loss, and so on. So you have sometimes small variation. Sometimes it can be errors, of course. And what can you do with this? We'll see this later after the pause when we can, we can search for those STR profile with a tool, which is called class. Okay, let's change uh, subject and go on different information properties of the cell lines that you can find. And here I list again six different type of uh, category of information which I will describe. I'm just looking at the time to see where I am in terms of time before the uh, pause. And maybe to slow down a little bit because uh, I'm trying to do things too fast. Now, in terms of those category of sunland properties, the first one is easy to explain. It's a category. We define 14 categories of cell lines, transform, cancer, embryonic, hybridoma. You recognize like this a number of different type of cell line. And each cell line is currently assigned to only one category which can be a little bit an issue because you have cell lines which have been both transformed and telomerized, immortalized. So this may change in the future, but currently it's easy. A cell line is assigned to one of those 14 categories. And in terms of statistics, you can see that the biggest set of cell lines are transformed, followed by cancer, embryonic, uh, induced preoperatant. It's This one is growing quite nicely. It will overcome embryonic stem cell very quickly. And uh, I'm sure it will even go above cancer cell lines in a number of years because everyone is creating induced purported stem cells now. Now, why is transformed cell line the largest category? Because you can take blood, take the B lymphocyte, and use EBV to immortalize them. So it's a nice way of immortalizing cells from patients. And people which are working on genetic disease are creating a lot of those cell lines. Coriel, the site I was mentioning with the biggest cell line collection, out of the 40,000 cell lines in Coriel, I would say 30,000 are EBV transformed cell lines. So that's the reason why you have so many transformed cell lines. Now, characteristic and biotechnology, this currently is free text and it's like a little bit of text describing the cell line, like useful for study of drug delivery or phagocytosis and so on. It's only taken from publication or from cell line collection. It's not meant to be a long text, just a one or two liners telling you something about the cell line. And sometimes it's on biotechnological use of the cell line, like MRC5, which is used for production of a number of diploid cell vaccines. If you were to go on the Vero cell line, you will have information, for example, on the fact that it's used for growing some of the SARS-CoV-2 COVID uh, vaccine and so on. Now, another field is doubling time. So this is captured mostly from publication, sometimes from cell collection. And it's basically capturing what people say is the doubling time of the cell line. Sometimes there is additional information, like the fact that it's been recorded at seventh passage. Sometimes the media, cell line media is, is important for the doubling time, but basically it's easy to, or the temperature, like here, whereas uh, it's 21 days of doubling time at four Celsius and, and 84 days at one Celsius. And about 7,000 cell lines contain such information. A lot of people don't record this information when they publish information on cell line. Now, karyotypic information, this is recent, uh, recent text, free text command line to, I mean, capture information relevant to karyotypic of a cell line. We don't want to capture all of the karyotypic information, but some noteworthy features. So you have things like as lost chromosome Y, uh, or like is this one is hyper, hyper pentaploid karyotype has almost twice as many chromosomes as its parental cell line and so on. So information which can be useful, I mean, in terms of karyotypic information. Macro stability, macro instability. So that's more, I mean, uh, 
uh, important for colorectal cancer cell line, but other type of cancer. And this there is a control vocabulary because cell line can be called stable or MSI low or MSI, uh, MSI uh, instable high. So you have this information and where it was obtained from, either stable, instable, low, instable, high. And, so and only 1,400 entries with such information, but because mainly it's colorectal and other cancer cell line, but not all type of cancer. Okay, let's go to another field, which is information, which basically has to do with how the cell line is engineered, or it's transformed, or it's transfected and transduced, or there are knockouts on the cell line, or it's selected for resistance and other type of engineering. So one thing is, as I said before, you can transform a cell line using a variety of ways. I told you about using EBV, but people use also SV40, the virus, but you can use chemical uh, carcinogen, you can use radiation, UV or cobalt radiation and so on to immortalize a cell line. So we basically indicate which transformation method was used using a number of databases because things like radiation is not found in the same database as chemical and virus. So you have things like KBI for chemicals, which tell you this, this uh, chemical, which is a mutagenetic chemical has been used to, or it can be a tax ID of a species like Epstein-Barr or an information in NCI thesaurus on the cobalt gamma radiation and so on. So different uh, uh, database for a different type of, uh, three different database for different type of methods. And this is used both for artificially transformed cell line and for cancer cell lines that have arisen through viral carcinogens. Now transfection or transduction, either using a chemical carrier or viral vector, often you know, I mean a retroviral, Character. So it's basically transfected, so information even so that it could be, it's both transfected or transduced. And again, you have a database accession and description. Here, you have information on a database, on, a, on an entry, a cell line which has been transfected with KRAS, but with a mutation in KRAS. Here, transfected with a mouse gene. Here, transfected with luciferase, with the codon optimize codon usage for mammalian expression. For a moment, we're using transfected for both transfection and transduction. So if you have an idea, sorry, of a more uh, appropriate term, we are client for a term which could replace both transfected and transduced. I mean, uh, to make it more uh, obvious that both type of things can be done. Now, another thing is knockout. You can knock out a gene. And again, I'm not going to go in a lot of details, but you have the method, CRISPR, Talon, KO mouse, and which gene has been KO inside the cell line. You can select for resistance. Again, same type of format, a database like KBI for drug, drug bank for big drugs like uh, monoclonal antibodies because you have a number of cancer cell lines which have been selected because they're resistant to monoclonal antibodies which are used as anti-cancer drugs. And sometimes it can be even uh, uh, against a toxin, which is a protein. So it's selected to resistance to a uniprot, I mean, with using uniprot accession because it's, uh, I mean, uh, a toxin and can even be radiation. So we have about, uh, as you see, 13,000 cell lines with 235 different compounds, which are used to select the cell line. And also we will describe this, you can have cell line where you, one position in a sequence has been edited, especially using CRISP-Cas9. And this we indicate in sequence variant field where something can be either edited or even corrected. If there was a mutation, for example, in a, in a cell line for a, a patient with a mutation, you can have uh, this mutation corrected using CRISPR-Cas9 or zinc finger nuclease and so on. So this, I will come back when we speak about sequence variation. 
Cell line groups and panel, I will go quickly on it. It's simple. Groups is that we group together some cell lines so they can be retrieved easily without doing complex queries. So we have groups for a lot of uh, taxonomic groups like amphibian, bird, cetacean, crustacean, fish, insect, and so on. So if you want all fish cell line, you don't need to think, oh, what is fish in the taxonomy of NCBI and try to do a very complex query, which you cannot do anyway currently with the search engine the way it's done on Cellosaurus. I will come back to that. But you can do it by just asking for that group of fish cell line. And you have other groups which are more specific to the use of a cell line in some way, uh, like a new group which was introduced a year ago, which are cell line which are used in SARS-CoV-2 research context. And even some uh, very specific uh, categories of cell line, like those which have been flown on spacecrafts, those which are from species or breed which has endangered, and so on. And how do you select this? It's easy. You basically, oh yes, uh, the endangered species is going to be something more and more useful because people uh, are more and more doing IPSC for a species which are threatened with extinction. And uh, you have things like here, this is a cell line which was established from a monkey which lived in San Diego Zoo and uh, which died, I mean, and uh, it's an endangered species of monkey. And you can basically browse inside the website by cell line group. And the so same thing is cell line panels, which basically are groups of cell line which have been defined by different scientists for different reasons, like the NCI 60 cancer cell line from the National Cancer Institute. And we have identified now more than 110 cell lines, panels. And again, you can query, so it's browsed by cell line panels, and then you get an alphabetical list of 110. Here, it's of course only the beginning of them by alphabetical order. And you can say, oh, I want all of the cell line by the 90 plus study cell line collections. That was a, a collection of cell line of people above 90 year old, or the Ceph. Centre d'études du polymorphisme humain in Paris, Amish pedigree cell line collection, also Canadian Alzheimer's disease, kindred cell collection, and so on. Now, let's go to, I mean, something quite important, which is disease information. And I will, uh, and normally I will maybe st stop just after that and do the pause. Even so, we will have still one or two things to describe in terms of contents, but I'm sure you're all tired, I'm tired, and it's some water also, so we'll stop after those nine slides here. So annotating disease with, I mean, uh, NCIT and Orphanet, I will explain. What is NCIT cellulosaurus value set? I will explain that. And how do we annotate sequence variation? Okay, so disease. So I told you already that a lot of cell lines come from disease individuals. And so to annotate what disease the person suffering, the person who was a donor of that cell line was suffering from, we use either the NCI thesaurus or often at order. And sometimes both, and if both exist, we use both inside one cell line entry. So NCI thesaurus, why is this? People ask, why did we use NCI thesaurus? Because to our knowledge, it's the only disease ontology which caters not only for human disease, but also for non-human disease. So we wanted to have also terms for dog, cat, rat, whatever you want, cancer or other type of disease. And it's extremely useful and responsive to create new term when the term is missing. So they have created almost uh, 500 terms now uh, for the cellosaurus, just because those terms were not yet in NCI thesaurus. And often at all though, it's because it's basically for human rare disease. And that's the standards of annotation for human rare disease now. So we annotate to both of them. Of course, a lot of, of uh, cell lines do not have often at terms because they're not either human cell line, so they cannot have it, or they're not rare disease. If you have a cancer, a lug cancer cell line, you won't have an orphanet term because it's not a rare disease lung cancer, unfortunately. 
So you will have orphanate order only for rare cancer in human. So about half of the cellular centuries are notated with at least one disease term, which is normal because we have so many cancer cell lines and so many rare disease cell lines. And we use over 2,000 NCI tesaurus term and above about 1,200 orphanate terms in cellulosaurus. Now, we don't annotate currently cell line arising from carrier of a genetic disease with disease terms. What I mean by this, if somebody is suffering from cystic fibrosis, yes, the cell line will be annotated with cystic fibrosis in order and in NCI tesaurus. But if it's a cell line from the parent of someone suffering from this disease and who has one copy of the, let's say, of the gene defect with a defect, but no, I mean, no sign of the disease, we don't currently annotate the disease term. This may change, and we may change completely the way we annotate disease by annotating if somebody is carrier or something like that. And also, if, but that's normal. If a cell line originates from the non cancerous tissue in a cancer patient, we don't annotate with disease term, but that's normal. If you have a cancerous patient and you take, uh, for example, of a lung cancer patient, his or her skin cells, there's no reason to annotate this as a lung cancer because the skin cells are not touched by it, except if there is, of course, a metastatic tumor. And cell lines which are addicted to correct the disease-causing mutation are annotated with the disease term. Even so, they lost the disease mutation. So this may change. Now, in terms of what I was telling you about the C NCI disease terminology, what happened is NCI, when they collaborate with a group, they create what they call a value set. They call it cellulosaurus disease terminology. It's not correct because it's not the terminology of the cellulosaurus. It's a subset of NCI tesaurus, which is used in cellulosaurus. But it means that from the NCI tesaurus, you can download all the terms which are used in the cellulosaurus from NCI. Now, an important thing, and we still have four slides before the pause, it's sequence variation, whether it's a genetic disease causing mutation, important oncogenic somatic mutation, gene deletion or amplification, and gene fusions. So we try to capture this using the HGVS nomenclature. And when a variation exists in ClitVar, about 50% of the variant we describe will link back to the relevant entry. So here you can see a mutation in the gene B2M with the HGNC, I mean, uh, cross-reference. So mutation description, it's homozygous, so paper. And here, no cross-reference to ClinVar because this mutation is not in ClinVar. But this one, for example, in TP53, has a ClinVar link. Oops, sorry, this was not meant to click on it. And you basically have the link to ClinVar. Here you see a gene fusion between two. Oops, I should not click. And so basically, you have different type of sequence variation which can be annotated inside cellulosaurus. They can belong to four categories, amplification, deletion, fusion, and mutation. Mutation being the high, biggest set of variants which are annotated currently. Here is ex our examples for each of them, a gene amplification. Here uh, it's in synuclein, which is amplified a lot in uh, Parkinson's disease patients. A deletion, a quite common deletion in a gene which is deleted, uh, I mean, CDKN, I mean, uh, in cell cycle, I mean, which is uh, quite often deleted in a cancer cell line. A gene fusion, one of the most well known gene fusion, BCRABL, called Philadelphia chromosome gene fusion, and a mutation, a normal, I would say, standard mutation. Here it's a one base pair, but it can be many base pair, with uh, zygosity indicated. Now, about 20% of one entry contain at least one sequence variation. It's about 6,500 variation on 1,300 genes. Most of them, 90% are on human cell line because that's what people are, of course, more interested in. And it's a work in progress because we have not yet caught up with retrofitting cancer cell line with some oncogenic mutation. 
Okay, so we'll start now with briefly, I will try to go quickly to a number of things, more slowly to things which are more important. First thing here will be fast because this is on hybridoma. I think that a lot of you, I mean, are using monoclonal antibody, but you're not really working with the hybridoma producing those monoclonal antibodies. You buy some monoclonal antibody, but not the cell producing it. So what we annotate is the isotype of the antibody which is produced by the hybridoma and the target. And that means that basically, I mean, uh, it's, if it's the isotype, it's information like the type of immunoglobulin and type of light chain, like here, HG1, kappa, HG2A, IgM lambda, and the target, which is of course the important part, it's basically either KB or Uniprot if the molecular entity is well known, it's defined, it's, a, it's a, like a target here, it's a mono, producing a monoclonal antibody recognizing this human protein with a Uniprot accession or the KBI accession if it's, a, if it's a chemical, or it can be free text when it's not define what is the molecular target of a monoclonal antibody. So either structure or free text. And now there is about 7,000 hybridoma with target information. Okay, here I would go so quickly on these fields, which are a number of miscellaneous fields, which are some are more or less important than others. And I will go through it quickly. Registration is to indicate in which type of register a database has been maybe entered, like the ICLAC register of, uh, of cell lines which are uh, contaminated. People, maybe some of you work on patents and you know that if you patent a biological object, whether it's a, a bacteria or a cell line, you need to deposit this cell line or this bacteria into an international depository authority like ATCC in US, uh, C I mean, different uh, authorities in different countries, and they give you a number, a registration number. And there are different type of registration. Uh, we, we have, uh, I mean, in Switzerland for, I mean, uh, I mean uh, embryonic stem cells, there's a registry from the Swiss Confederation of cell line, which can be used in research and so on. And you see different type of registry. Other fields is discontinuation. That's important. It's to tell that a cell line is no longer distributed by a cell line collection or company. So this we try to indicate. And when you have the cross-reference to the cell line collection, you cannot click on one which is called for discontinuated. And you see that the cell line used to be, I mean, sold by ATCC or by ICLC, but it's not anymore. Now, as I said, Companies or cell line collection don't do this. And it's, so it's a really a nightmare to try to email them saying, can you confirm that you really uh, are not distributing anything, is this cell line or not? And sometimes they say, oh no, we're doing it, but we forgot it from our catalog. Or yes, we're not doing it for the last two years and so on. So it's in fact, it's the only place I think where you can find this information currently in the world in Cellosaurus because nobody else is keeping up this information on discontinued cell line. So as you see, there's many discontinuation information. So it doesn't mean 8,400 discontinued cell line because as you see, one cell line can have, have been discontinued by two cell collection and not by others and so on. Anecdotes, I mean, uh, it's, as it says, it's anecdotes. So I won't go, we have too many things to see today. So I won't, I let, you can look at this in the uh, presentation. And it's basically sometimes by reading some papers, I stumble on things which are uh, anecdotal and I feel as an urge to report it because I find this interesting. I mean, it would be otherwise too dry to only report things which are important scientifically. Sometimes history of science or sociology of science is interesting. Uh, caution. It's all kind of issue which do not directly affect the integrity of a cell line, otherwise it will be problematic. And it's in a caution field. That would be the example of the question which was asked, TP53 mutation, not in the same place. Oh, well here, but I, I forgot I give this example. TP53 mutation indicated incorrectly. Here we know that it was incorrect, but some case it will be, you know, saying so that there is a conflict between two publications. 
here it's known that this publication was had an incorrect mutation. Or here, this was indicated to be from a three-year-old female patient and from a nine-month-old in table one of the same paper. So it's not the same age depending on the part of the paper. So once they sh we try to get them resolved, we try to find, but sometimes they stay. And uh, here, this one, we don't know if this line SD4 is a misspelling or SO4. So they have same type of uh, properties of description, but uh, it's all papers from the 1990s, which nobody, no groups is working on those cell lines anymore. And omics field is to indicate what type of omics experiment was carried out on a, on a protein, on no, from the cell line, like proteomics, transcriptomic, SNPRA. So a lot of different type of experiments can be carried out. Incomplete, complete genome, I mean, uh, of a cell line, it can be the case. And finally, entry history, which tells you when the entry was created and when it was last updated and the number of times it was updated. Some cell lines are updated almost at every release because I'm used stuff to put in at every release. And some less. Here's, I didn't put this up to date since uh, release 37. You see that some cell line are only updated once or twice, but many are updated four to seven times since they were created and sent you have a long tail of cell lines which are updated almost like every few months. Now, important information, child-parent relationship or sister autologous cell line relationships. Parent-child relationship is easy to explain. When a cell line is derived from another cell line, it's a child of that cell line. And you have a hierarchy statement derived and in OBO it's called derived from. So for example, the cell line MCF7 tax R is derived from the cell line MCF7. Easy to understand. And yes, hybrid cell line can have more than one parent because they're hybrid and they can have more two, three or four uh, parents. So about a third of the cellulosis entry describes cell line derived from another cell line. People have derived thousands of different cell lines from ELA, from MCF7, from others, from EC-293. There's probably uh, more than 2,000 EC-293 cell line derived. And you can see here in the entry, here it's FG2 derived cell line, all of the child of a cell line. And when you go to the cell line itself can have, of course, a parent, but it can have a, a child itself. So you can have more than one generation. Here is a nice graph using wiki data of MCF7, which has a number of cell lines which themselves have children and so on. You, could, uh, you can do like this nice graph like this. Now, autologous cell lines, it's cell lines that are derived from same individual. So this happens when people are deriving more than one cell line from different tissue or from the same person at different time course, a cancer cell line before, I mean, uh, before getting uh, chemotherapy and after chemotherapy uh, and so on. So you have cell lines like that, which are from same patient or same animal. And this is indicated and in the entry, you have the list of the other cell lines which are derived from the same donor. So that means that FTC 133 is from same donor as FTC 236 and 238. And you have about 10% of the entries which have one or more sister cell lines. Finally, cross-reference and web links. So not finally, so still after one thing. Cross-reference and web links. Cross-reference, we have cross-reference to a lot of resources. And that also answers the question of, do we cross-reference to cell bank, which sells database? Yes, of course. And there is currently, I mean, uh, today we reach 99 different resources which are cross-linked to cell others. And you have about 400,000 cross-reference inside the cellulosaurus, so about three in average per entry, which is quite a lot. And they can be cell line collection, cell line database, biological sample resource, everything you want, which has information on that cell line. So of course, cell collection has a major part, but it can be a lot of different things. And you have them classified by topics inside the uh, web's uh, view. So to answer again the question, where can I buy my cell line? 
Well, you look at cell line collection and you see this cell line is sold by ATC, by BCRC, which is in Taiwan and by BCRG, which is in uh, Brazil. And you have cross-reference to cell line database resource, anatomical retype, cell type resource, biological sample, chemistry resource, and so on, gene expression, polymorphism, sequence database, and so on. And web links are just links to page of uh, on site which go to resource which have either very few entry or which have inconsistent URLs. So it can be page on someone uh, web page on the lab which is using a cell line and which is describing that cell lines. So just web page. Now I go really to the last part of the contents reference, which are quite of course important. And reference. As I said, we tried to include the reference that we have used to annotate the cell line. And those are the ones which describes the establishment and characterization of cell line and other which have information which was useful to build the entry. But it's not an attempt to capture all papers that make use of a cell line. I mean, uh, you, if you did this, ELA would have uh, 500 or 1,000 papers or 1 million papers, would be completely crazy. So it's a uh, papers which are interesting because they have inside information which contribute to the entry which you're looking at. So about 23,500 different publications. As I said before, papers cited have been created. And four types of publications, the majority, great majorities are article. Patents are in fact not, I mean, something to forget. A lot of Hybridoma and some other engineer cell line are found in patents. And there is book chapters, meeting abstract books, etc., and thesis, which is not frequent, but still, I mean, it's a good thing about thesis is people have, sp uh, people have space to describe what they've used. And often you will have a paper having three lines on the cell line, and the thesis from the PhD student has 10 pages describing the cell line much more in depth. And Fortunately, more and more theses are online. And you can have four types of identifier on cell line. It can be a permit ID, a DOI, a patent number, or a number we created ourselves for everything which doesn't have a permit ID or a DOI or a patent number. Not a lot, but uh, so you see most publication you find in permit, 92% and 81% have both permit and DOI. And you have some paper which are not in PubMed and have DOI. So those are paper on fish and insect cell line because fish and insect were not really captured, literature on fish and insect were not really captured well by PubMed, which was a medical database. So they didn't really care on fish and insect for a long time and plant. But as we don't care about plant also, we don't have this. And only a few of them are not in any of those, uh, do not have a, a DOI or PubMed ID because they're all paper or abstracts. So number of citations per year, you see there was a climb, then there was a decrease, and now again a climb. It's not it's an artifact of the curation process. It's a fact that, I mean, there was a decrease because people were not publishing any more paper describing new cancer cell line or things like that. And then there was this rise in paper describing IPSC. So it's a new uh, bump. This, this fact that this is ragged is probably an artifact of, uh, of curation, but uh, the fact that it's growing again is because of IPSC. Okay, how to make use of cellulosaurus? You can go on the web. I mean, I'm not going to go now and do it and do a full description, except if we have time after, but basically the most important thing on the, on the page is, is the search bar. And I will explain a few things about the search and oh, it's deficient now, and what we're going to do to make it better, thanks to the position we have from the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics for developing. So it's on Expasi, uh, Cellosaurus, you just Google and you find it. It's, as I said before, it's since 2015, I said it at the beginning of the, the talk, and it's now used by over 3,000 people per day, 3,000 sessions. So we reached 10 times million page view about a week ago, or two weeks ago, exactly. So that's quite a lot. It's increasing, as you see, I mean, uh, quite every, so you see the dip of Christmas quite well, Christmas, New Year, people stop working. 
you see a lower dip in uh, at uh, spring break. Like uh, it's uh, sociologically, it's interesting. You see this dip here. I don't. I guess you see my cursor now, everyone. Do you see my cursor, uh, Monique? Do you? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. This dip is the beginning of the uh, lockdown of COVID. So uh, suddenly, people left the lab and were not yet organized to work uh, at home or things like that. But so you had a big dip on the few days which started, uh, I mean, the, the confinement in most countries. Now, uh, here I got, I'm going to skip this because I can go later to maybe show an entry with a different part, but you can go yourself and look at an entry and I will concentrate first on text search because that's quite important. So we have a full text search option, meaning that you type in something and it's search. For those which are technically inclined, it's built using uh, Apache Lucy, which is a Lucene a text search uh, engine. And of course, you can look for search for a cell line name, and it looks for the cell line names, the synonyms, everything which is inside the database. But you can also, of course, look for catalog number in the cell line, disease name, species, authors, title, permit ID, sequence variation, transfected gene, and so on. So everything is indexed. So you have the search bar and you just type in. But of course, text search are great, but it's also a great way of not finding the right thing or finding too many things. What I mean is that it's text. So if you're searching, for example, for I mean uh, something, you should use as much as possible a precise term and that precise term often can be an accession number. So if you're using a, looking for species, it's better to use the taxonomic identifier of that species rather than typing the name of the species. Uh, I'll give you an example. If you type dog, yes, you will find some cell lines. But if you type 9,615, you find all of the text cell lines which are with the tax ID of dog. Now, you can could say, but why can I type dog? Well, you can maybe get an article which has a title, which says uh, study of, uh, of cat and dog uh, cell line, but which by chance is uh, uh, cross reference inside a cat, because it's speaking of dog and cat, it's in fact referenced inside the cat cell line entry. And so you get also this cat cell line inside your dog uh, search. Same thing if you want SV40 transform cell line, you better search for the tax ID of SV40 rather than SV40 because you will pick up otherwise every title of article which has SV40. And if you want a knockout for CD4, don't look for CD4, use AGNC1678. Or if you're looking for an antibody against CD4, the protein, look for PZ1. Seven cystic fibrosis. Here I search cystic fibrosis. I get two hundred and two hits. Yes, no, it's a recording. Okay, well. So you only have here the cell line which are from cystic fibrosis. Here, you want to see those which are, I mean, with the deletions, and you can type the H, V, and C number of the deletion. You could also type in the ClinVar number, but here the deletion is generally quite precise enough to be able to, to get something which is really what you want. So in a nutshell, just to go back, try to use the most precise terms that you can, but it's not perfect. And our plan is to do two things, which I will describe briefly at the end, but if I don't have time to go in more details, I will describe them now, is one to have still a feel free text, full text index, but to be able, like you can do in PubMed, but people generally don't do, is to tag what you want to search and to say in which field you want. 
So if you said CD4, for example, you could say, I want to look at it only inside, uh, you know, uh, for example, transfected. So it will look only for the name CD4 inside the field transfected and not inside the title of an article. Or if you want to look for, I mean, something else like cystic fibrosis, search only inside the disease name for cystic fibrosis and not elsewhere and so on. And the second thing, sorry, which is, is to build what we call a sparkle endpoint. I will describe this maybe a bit later by showing an example of what it means using the Wikidata. Okay, another tool which you can use, which has nothing to do with what we saw now, is the similarity search tool, but for STR profile. This was developed by Thibaut Robin, who was a PhD student, which developed a program to take the STR profile which you have in Celosaurus and search for similarity against the profiles that you provide. It works on human, mouse, and dog STR markers as uh, the three species which exist. It accepts all the different STR markers which people have used over the years. It uses a number of different algorithms. I won't go into it. If you don't know, just don't change anything. Don't use the default back. I would say, if you're not a specialist of STR profile, it's a bit like if you're not a specialist of BLAST, don't touch the default parameters. They're already preset for people which are not experts. If you're an expert, do change everything you want. If you're not, take what's default. You can either do it on one cell line or a batch mode using an input file with all the cell line you have. You, for those which are more inclined to do it programmat programmatically, you can use this with the RESTful API and it's really fast. So you basically enter either with a file or typing in your, your values, you search, and it goes back with the list of cell line and the match, percent match. Those which are in red are known cell line which are contaminated. So here you see a list of a lot of cell line which have 100 or 99% because they're all either HT29 derived cell line or cell line which have been contaminated by HT29. And you have the list of the different hits between your profile and the one you entered. And you can click on the red and it tells you it's a problematic cell line and so on. Now, and I will describe a project we did in, in exactly four or five minutes to explain in terms of uh, also it will lead to what I was telling you about, about Sparkle Endpoint and making very precise search. Most of you have probably heard of Wikipedia. Maybe not all of you have called, heard of Wikidata. Wikidata is basically a type of streamline, uh, uh, oh, I could say it. it's, a, it's a pendant of Wikipedia, but not in text way, in a database mode. Basically, instead of having a text saying, uh, you know, whatever you want, the lake of Le Mans is the biggest lake in uh, Western Europe and associated kilometers, you would have statements saying Lac Le Mans is a lake, lake as surface, so and so. So basically, it's a, it's a database of all kinds of information, basically of everything which you can think of, which is based on what are we call triple. A triple being basically you have a subject, a verb, and an object, like so. I mean, uh, Lac Léman is a lake. So basically, uh, you define this uh, lake surface is 350 kilometers. I don't know what it is, probably going wrong, but anyway, square kilometer. And so in Wikidata, people are trying to enter all kinds of information, including biological data. So we initiated five years ago a product to develop a boat. It's a software tool which populates Wikidata with cell line concept. Each concept is equivalent to a cellosaurus entry, meaning a cell line. So there was a student, Lelia, which developed this, and now there is a bioinformatician from Brazil, Tiago Lubiana, which is updating this bot. And what we do is try to enter into Wikidata a little bit of information on cell lines. And now inside Wikidata, you have as many cell line concepts as there is cell line in cellosaurus. Now, Everything which is in cell service cannot be modeled in Wikidata. For example, we cannot put STR profile. We cannot put, I mean, uh, disease. We can put disease, but we cannot put mutation yet because not all the mutation are there and so on. So we have a number of information items. I'm not going to go through all of them, but of course, the name and synonym, accession, the species, 
sex, category, disease, and so on, and cross-reference to CLO and HPS reg, and the PubMed cross-reference. So now that it is in, you can look at it inside Wikidata. Not very useful because what you find is much less than Celosaurus. So if you go to this entry XP100 TMA, it tells you it's a cell line. Yes, great, in French and German. It tells you it is a cell line. It is a finite cell line. It is autologous to this so as a sister cell line. It has two papers. It's established from a medical condition which excel their mapigmentism group C from Homo sapiens male. Uh, it can be found in CLO with this succession number, with those succession, it's in Cellosaurus and so on. So you could say, why go there? Much less data than in Cellosaurus. Yes, but it's linked to all of the data in Wikidata, which means you can do what we call federated queries across different sets of data. And you can use the hierarchy of the different ontology which are used inside Solosaurus. Like, for example, if I go back to Xeroderma pigmentism group C, well, yes, you can look inside Solosaurus for Xeroderma pigmentism group C, but you cannot look in one search item for every disease which touch the skin, like Xeroderma, or like every disease which is a disease which is sensitive to light. While in Wikidata, you can do this because the hierarchy is built in into all of the objects you enter. So you can do like mini programs, those are called Sparkle queries, where you say, I want cell lines, which are objects which have a cellosaurus ID, which are linked with a disease. And this disease have a property called Q6013981. Of course, you don't cannot know what it is, but if you query it, you will see that it means carbohydrate metabolism disorder. And this is annotated with orphanet ID. So what I'm doing here, I'm searching for all cell lines which are associated with disease, which are, have an orphanet identifier. And those are the category of disease which are carbohydrate metabolism disorder. Currently, I cannot do this from the cellosaurus because if I type carbohydrate metabolism disorder, you won't find anything because they are annotated to the disorder themselves. But if you do this in Wikidata, you can have some cell lines and you can see, see this one is pyruvate decarboxylase, this one is galactosemia, this one is uh, e primary hyperaccelerator type one. So it's a nice way currently to do those type of very complex search even so that we don't have this capability in Cellosaurus. But the good news is in about a year, we will be able to do this also from the Cellosaurus. But currently you can do this through Wikidata. Now, downloading the Cellosaurus, you can download by FTP in three formats, OBO, structured text, and XML. So OBO format, I mean, if you don't know what OBO is, don't even bother about it. It's for people which are really building ontology and say use this format, also all format, which can be converted from OBO. We don't distribute all, but people can convert from OBO to all. And it doesn't contain all of the data because it cannot contain things like STR profile, age, full reference, and so on. So basically the two main format is either text or XML. And uh, I'm here I'm getting into more uh, complex things that you, in fact that you, I mean, don't have the cross-reference inside, you have cross-reference, but the exact URL are not inside the file. You have to build them if you want to instantiate that. I mean, basically what I'm trying to get there is if you're a programmer, use the XML version. If you want to look at an entry, use the text version, but XML is the one which allows you to pass everything and store everything into a database. You can download it. And well, here I'm describing the XML version. So additional file, which are distributed with it, which are more or less obvious by the name. So release nodes, the list of deleted accession number, frequently asked, asked question and so on. So abstract for all those publications which either do not have a DOE or do not have both, neither a DOE nor a PubMed. So you, you cannot, have their abstract, except if you aren't 
in different publication or like we did, we OCR some of those abstracts so that they're available. And you can basically download all of this. Of course, it's free. It's, as I said at the beginning, it's uh, in, uh, in its structure. It's, uh, you can also download each individual entry when you look at it in structure text. When you're looking at an entry at top of the entry, you can say it says saves the text version just uh, at the top of the entry. And you get uh, just that entry in text mode, like here, with the uh, entries themselves and the publication, the full record for the publications. Now, uh, also, you, for those which are more programmatically inclined, you can get all of those files on GitHub. Uh, to do it, uh, if you, I mean, uh, user of uh, GitHub, you know what it is. If not, probably you don't need it. And uh, it doesn't contain the Celsius XML file, which is too big for uh, GitHub, because GitHub is more to trace evolution of software tools, not really to do a database. So archiving the database is done somewhere else. It's done on a software tool called Yareta, which is an institutional repository of Geneva University. And you have all of the release of the Celsius, which have been archived there from release two to now. But from release two to 32, you don't have the Obo and XML file. And so you can get any release and download so it's old release. Now, last two things. And uh, is what can be added. A lot of things can be added. What we're thinking about is to cover patient-derived xenograft because it's currently only cell line, not patient-derived xenograft. Now, one thing which will be useful, but I'm not sure, of course it's useful and it's even more useful now that people are, I mean, of course, studying more and more, I mean, all kinds of virus for the next pandemic or the next epidemic is to which cell line can be susceptible to infection by virus because people want to use cell lines to study different type of virus. And when, for example, uh, also work started on SARS-CoV-2, there was a mad rush to test hundreds of cell lines to see what, I mean, cell line could be used. And what people used was already information on cell line which was susceptible to SARS-CoV or other coronavirus, thinking that maybe they could also be used, which is quite logical. So information on susceptibility of cell line to infection by virus, experimental information, would be nice to capture. And, but this would need probably a specific grant and one person really working full-time on it. So this is not for a moment something planned directly for 2022, maybe 2023, if we get a grant for it. Information on biosafety level would be useful for industry. Again, to go back to a question which was asked to suppose that's maybe something which can be added as a teaser for industry to pay for license of uh, helping to develop the cellulosary thing, we add biosafety level because they really want to know which is the biosafety level of the cell lines. Now, structure of the information, as I said already, all of the tissue organ cell types should be linked to UBRON and cell ontology. And the age information should be linked to developmental ontology so that you can search all cell lines from a teenager or below all cell lines for different type of developmental stage. Restructures information on cell line availability because there is no cross-reference to cell line collection, discontinuation, some information on loss of cell line. And maybe also to go back to the question where it was saying, oh, but if it's not in the collection or can I know where it is, we could capture maybe if someone tell us, oh, we're distributing the cell line, you know, don't, I mean, you can tell people to mail us. We could add the email address of people which are willing to redistribute their cell line because some people do. And for moments, this is not in, uh, indicated. Tools, a lot of things will be done because we now have one software developer which can work on Celosaurus and improve web representations. We want to have forms for users to enter preliminary new cell line entries, so to submit. I told you about the Sparkle endpoint to advance search and for the query, but also to advance text search. And for developer, uh, this turtle triple RDF, terse RDF language, which allow people to use 
Salesorus in, in the context of what is called semantic web, an API to query or download the database so that you can do, I mean, a very specific query in a programmatic way and retrieve exactly what you want. An alerting system for newly discovered contamination misidentification. This again is something that industry would like to have. So all of these are developments which can be done. I mean, now that we have someone on board uh, to do this. Which leads me to the people who work on Celosaurus. Elizabeth Gasteiger, which who is uh, one of software developer for Swissprot, for the Uniprot group in general, and was one of the first person to develop Expasi when in 1993, when Expasi started. She's the one implementing the Celosaurus view on Expasi. So at every release of the Celosaurus, she writes or changes the script to make it possible for you to access it on Expasi. Thibaut developed the class tool during his PhD study, uh, studies. Alain Gatto, which just retired a few months ago, was a software developer in our group, in Export California group. And he developed the tools that translate the Celosaurus from text format to Obo and XML and check that everything syntax is okay. I mentioned already Lilia, Lilia and Thiago for the Wikidata bot. And Pierre-André Michel, who started not in the group because he's been in the group for already a long time, but we started working on the Celosaurus a couple of months ago, and he's starting the long road towards development of all the tools I was telling you, the software tools. I mentioned already by saying she's a cell line detective, Amanda Cape Davis. She was the former Secretary General of ICLAC. She just stopped being the Secretary General this year because it was too much work. And, uh, but she's still being a detective, a cell line detective, trying to hunt all problems case for cell line. And all of the people which are answering my questions or which are submitting information on cell lines. You, have, you can always ask questions, of course, now, but after using the email address, Celosaurus at Civ Suisse, or the contact, you can contact on Celosaurus page. On Twitter, we put a lot of information on things which are new, on the tidbits of information on Celosaurus. So you can follow also the Twitter handle. It's not spam, basically all of the things which are in that uh, feed are useful information for people using Celosaurus. And it's not a lot of tweets, so it's not you're not going to be spam. 